I'd like to welcome you today. Episode number two of our new series called I Am Christian. I Am Christian. We want to welcome you today as we uh, discuss uh, what it means to be an, a Christian and what it means to be shaped into His image, that is the image of Christ. In lesson number one, uh, over in the book of Acts, uh, chapter 11, we found out that the, the disciples and the followers of Christ were first called Christians at Antioch. There at Antioch, they gathered all together and they called them and named them Christians. In Greek, that word is Christianos, Christianos. That's what it is in Greek, it's plural, meaning, meaning multiple. But if you look into the actually what that name was in Greek, they called them the anointed ones. Now we call it Christians, but that's not what the Greeks call them. They called all those that were followers of Christ the anointed ones. So it's kind of interesting to do that because we want to find out now what it means to be anointed. If we were called anointed ones back in the Bible, so then today as they call us Christians, which is the English uh, pronunciation of that, then truly that should mean anointed ones and we should be anointed. So what does it mean or what does it take to be anointed? Well, the very first thing is to be anointed you have to take on the Spirit of Christ. And the Spirit of Christ is the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. So if you are filled with the Holy Spirit, not just Spirit moved upon you or moving through you, which the Holy Spirit does, but you are baptized or filled with. You know, Jesus said not many days hence you shall be filled with or baptized with the Holy Spirit. And that's how you begin the, the, the modification of your life to take on the image of Jesus Christ. Amen. And in that we will take on the nature of Christ. The more we take on His image, the more we take on His nature, His love, His compassion, His power, His authority. Every characteristic that Jesus Christ had, we will begin to take that on as we draw nearer and nearer and nearer unto Him. Now, if you look out in Luke chapter 10, verse 19, it says, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and serpents and to overcome all the power of of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. So we're going to take on the authority and the power, the authority and the power as, as a new anointed one following after Christ. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? We're also going to take on his other, like I said, love and compassion and all of those things. Now, let's look at Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 2, and uh, uh, let's see. No, I'm not quite there yet. Let me go. Uh, let's go to Romans 8 and 29. It says, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. He predestinated. In other words, it was in his plan. It doesn't mean that in, he, he wants everyone to be filled with the Spirit, but he didn't make it where you were have to be our, our necessity of life to be filled with the Spirit. And it might be a necessity for eternity, though. So it said, did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, those also he called, and whom he did call, he also justified, and whom he justified, them he glorified. What shall we say to all these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? So, we weren't born to be anointed. We didn't grow up to be anointed. We take on the anointing of His Spirit by receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. Then that process begins to take place. That metamorphosis, you know, like the caterpillar turns into the butterfly, starts taking place. And, and that's just a little bit what it's like. Now let's go to that 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 3.17 Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. King James says liberty. And we who with 
unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory as being transformed unto His likeness with ever-increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. It's saying that if we take a look at ourselves and say, hey, you know, here I am, this is what I am today, and you come back six months from now or a year from now and you take another look at that. I'm talking about self-examination. I'm not talking about just combing your hair in the mirror. And that self-examination, you start examining yourself and, and you say, hey, I've got more God in me now. I feel closer to God in me now. I, I have more zeal for the Lord now. And if you're seeing that, that's what he's talking about from glory unto glory. As you grow in God and become more like him, like, like looking in that mirror, when I look in the mirror, all I just see is another, another hair gone or something like that. But, but in the spiritual mirror, I can see that I'm trying to get closer and closer and closer to God, closer to God. Now, I don't know who I'm talking to out there. I know I'm talking around the world. I'm talking to people in India and people over in, in, in Africa, and I'm talking to people all over in Europe. I got some watching me in Europe and around the world. Got them here, plenty here in the United States watching me. But I would just venture to say there wasn't one of you born perfect. Somebody said, oh, look at that little darling baby. He's just so perfect. Well, yeah, he had 10 toes and 10 fingers and, and pretty eyes and a and, uh, little bit of hair and all that. But, but no one is born perfect. No one is born without sin. You say, oh, well, that's just a sinless baby. I've known some pretty mean little babies, so we're not going to go there. But the thing is, we are not born perfect. We are striving for perfection. We strive for perfection. And that's what it's all about. It's, it's trying to reach another goal, trying to reach out a little closer to God, trying to do a little more for the kingdom of God. Walking with Christ is not a sedated thing. It's not sit on the pew and hear a good sermon and go home. Come on, folks. If that's all your relationship with God is, then you're missing out on some of the greatest things in the world is having that intimacy with God and that time where you talk to God and God talks to you. And in all of that, and when we establish that relationship, God carries you a little further and a little further and a little further and He reveals more to you and shows more to you. I've been filled with the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues for 60 years. I've been pastor in 52, preaching and pastor in 52 of those years. And, and God shows me new things every day. Every week I come across some great new thing. And, and as I watch that and, and, and read that Bible, and I, I may be watching something on TV on a, on a gospel show or something, all of a sudden, bing, the Holy Spirit starts talking to me. And I get my little notepad and I start writing down. And, say, and, and my wife's looking over and saying, God just gave you something, didn't he? And I say, yes, ma'am, he sure did. Why? Because we're striving. We're striving for that perfection. He said, here's, here, here's what he said, Philippians 3 and 13, Paul. Brethren, I count not myself to apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. Man, I want to pause here just a second because he said, I hadn't made it yet. I'm not perfect yet. I, God hadn't completed his work in me. Now, there's a song we used to sing that says, He's still working on me. Amen. And I want to tell you what, even after 60 years, God's still working on me. But, but the thing is here, he said, I, I hadn't made it yet, but this one thing, forgetting those things which are behind, don't ever let your past bother you. It, get right with God. Stay right with God. If you stumble and fall, a righteous man falls down seven times, gets back up. If you fall down, get back up and say, God, I'm so sorry. Help me not to do it again. And go on. If you fall another time, another time, get back up and serve God. Keep serving God. Forget those things. Don't let your past ever condemn you. And reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I push myself. It's like that runner. I, I, when I was in high school, I, ran, I was a miler. I ran the mile. That's four times around a 440-yard track. And we'd go and I'd try to pace myself and keep up with all the runners uh, for those first three laps. But halfway through that last, we did what you call the kick. 
and you put it into high gear and every ounce that was in you, you ran that last 220 yards with everything. Sometimes you'd fall across that finish line and you would collapse into the cinders on the track. Amen. Because you had just given everything you had and that's serving God. I press toward the mark of the high calling. I do everything I can in my power to reach that place, which is the high calling in Christ Jesus. Amen. When we receive the Holy Ghost, we take on a dual nature. I said we take on a dual nature. Now, Jesus had a dual nature. He was fully God. He was fully man. He was God when He walked on the water. He was God when He said, Peace be still, and it did. Amen. It was God when He started taking the bread and breaking it all to pieces. It was the Spirit of God working through Him, for in Him dwelt the fullness of the Godhead bodily. But He was also man. He was man when He hungered. He was mad when he, man when He slept in the back of the boat because it was wore out. He was man when He suffered in the garden and said, Father, please let this pass from me. Nevertheless, let thy will be done. That was man crying out. But it was God that was in him, for in him dwelt the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Let me, let me read you a real quick thing. This is from Romans chapter 7 and verse uh, uh, 15. I'm going to go through this fast. It says, I do not understand what I do. For what I do, uh, for what I want to do, I do not. But what I hate to do, I do. And if I do what I do, not what I want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. See, he had a sinful nature. For I desire to do, do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good... I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do, that I do and keep on doing is what he said. Now, if I do what I don't want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin that lives in me. I'm going fast. So I find the law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law worketh in my members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin to work within my members. What a wretched man that I am! Who will rescue me from this body of death? That was Paul. He was fighting within himself, fighting with his humanity, the two natures within him. He had the Holy Spirit. He was walking in God, but that old flesh, that old flesh wanted to keep cropping up and dragging him down and getting him, get a little anger come in there, a little jealousy come in there, a little of this or envy or something coming in there, and, and he'd have to rebuke it. He said, I die daily. I crucify, my, I crucify myself. That's what he was saying in another scripture. But here's what his answer was. Listen, listen to his answer. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in the sinful nature a slave to the law of sin. Now are you ready? Because I want you to hear this scripture. Therefore, now we put there, this is the next chapter. This is chapter 8 and 1. But man put the chapters in there. He wrote this all as one letter. Therefore there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You don't have to be condemned. You don't have to worry, well, did I sin today? Oh, God, did I? I'm going to have to pay penance. I'm going to have to do something. Give a little extra. Boy. Whoa, whatever. Oh. No, don't fear like that. There is no condemnation for them who are in Christ because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. Through the power and the anointing of His Spirit and His forgiveness and His righteousness, we are set free from that. We are overcomers. Another scripture said, with every temptation, He provides a way of escape. Come on, praise God. Hallelujah. Jesus proclaimed in the temple that his, his mission was to make men free. Let's read Isaiah 61 and 1. The Spirit of the Southern God is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. That's the, that's the original version. That's exactly the way Jesus read it in the temple in the Word of God. 
He said, I've come to set you free. God has come to set you free from sin. We're going to talk about that tomorrow. God's come to set you free from sin, so you don't have to live in sin anymore. You might make a mistake. You might slip every now and you might say a word you shouldn't, but God's there to give you a new beginning and a fresh start, just a little word of forgiveness. Go, oh, God, I shouldn't have said, and the Holy Ghost will speak to you, and you slap yourself on the side, side of the head and say, don't do that anymore. That's the God that we serve. John 8 and 36 so if the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed. If you're walking in the Spirit, living for God, you can walk with your head held high, no matter what your past was, no matter what you've done in the past, no matter whether you fell down and slipped last week and got back up, you can walk with your head high because you're walking in the forgiveness and the precious grace of God. So as we walk in the Spirit, we keep out the fleshly man. We keep that fleshly man under control. As we walk in the Spirit, we keep that fleshly man under control. As we do that, we are changed. I don't know about you, but <laughs> I got a picture on Facebook. Now, I don't look like that anymore, just tell you honest to God truth. And that wasn't all that many years ago. That picture was taken probably about 15 years ago, and maybe a little more than that. And I don't look like that anymore. I don't nearly have that much hair anymore. But we are changed. But we're not talking about a physical outside change. We're talking about a change in here. As we walk with God, we are changed. Change from common vessels to vessels of honor, to commonality to vessels of glory. That's how we're changed. Let's read 1 Peter 1 and 7. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold, that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen ye love, in whom though now ye see him not yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. What it, this is saying is even though we're tried in the faith, even though we go through tribulations and problems, we can have joy uh, unspeakable and full of glory because we know that God has set us free and we've been delivered by the power of the Holy Spirit from a sinful mankind nature. Praise God. And then in 1 Timothy 2 and 20, but in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself, if a man purge himself, it didn't say God's going to come down and smack you on the side of the head and pull all the sin out of you. It didn't say that. A man through repentance turning away from sin, that's part of what we talk about tomorrow, from all of that, if a man purge himself, from these things, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and ready for the master's use, prepared unto every good work. Changed from one image to another image, one image to another image. As you walk with God, as you go with God, as you draw closer to God, all of a sudden you're going to hear somebody say down the road, hey, that guy is really a Christian. You know, want to know why they're going to say that? They're going to say that because you have become an anointed one. That's where we started. Remember that? Christianos. The anointed ones. Cristiano is, is the singular. He is a Cristiano. Praise God. Hallelujah. The most beautiful thing in the world when someone will come up to you and say, you're really a Christian, aren't you? Yes, praise God, God saved me, and I can have a testimony I can do, those kind of things. Praise God. I want to take this moment. Tomorrow we're going to talk to you about how to know a true Christian. And right now, I just want to pray for you. I want to pray for you that God would help you and lead you and guide you, that you could take on the very image of Jesus Christ Himself. And we are, never forget, we are sons and daughters of God, and we are the image of Christ in the world 
today. Father, I thank you for allowing me to preach to the world. I thank you for letting me reach all those that are listening today. I pray for them. I pray for them around the world. As they send me requests, I'm praying for them, God, that God, you'd touch them, lift them up, supply their needs according to the riches of glory. And now I pray today, God, that you would mold them and shape them into your likeness so that when they walk through the streets of their cities or or the end of the supermarkets or, or into the marketplaces or wherever they go on their job, people would see them and know that they are really true, truly, truly, truly an anointed one, a follower of Jesus Christ. God bless you. 